Winter descended on Earl and gripped the forest, holding the small twigs stiff and still. In the valley it silenced the stream, and in the fields of the oxen the grass was brittle as earthenware, and the breath of the beasts went up like the smoke of encampments. And Orion still went to the woods whenever Oth would take him, and sometimes he went with Threl. When he went with Oth, the wood was full of the glamour of the beasts that Oth hunted, and the splendour of the great stags seemed to haunt the gloom of far hollows. But when he went with Threl, a mystery haunted the wood, so that one could not say what creature might not appear, nor what haunted and hid by every enormous bowl. What beasts there were in the wood even Threl did not know. Many kinds fell to his subtlety, but who knew if these were all? And when the boy was late in the wood, on happy evenings, he would always hear as the sun went blazing down, rank on rank of the elfin horns blowing far away eastwards in the chill of the coming dusk, very far and faint, like Reveille heard in dreams. From beyond the woods they sounded, all those ringing horns, from beyond the downs, far over the furthest curve of them, and he knew them for the silver horns of Elfland. In all other ways he was human, and but for his power to hear those horns of Elfland, whose music rings but a yard beyond human hearing, and his knowledge of what they were. But for these two things he was as yet not more than a human child. And how the horns of Elfland blew over the barrier of twilight, to be heard by any ear in the fields we know, I cannot understand, yet Tennyson speaks of them as heard faintly blowing, even in these fields of ours, and I believe that by accepting all that the poets say while duly inspired our errors will be fewest. So, though science may deny or confirm it, Tennyson's line shall guide me here. Alveric in those days went through the village of Earl, with his thoughts far from there, moodily, and he stopped at many doors and spoke and planned, with his eyes always fixed as it seemed on things no one else could see. He was brooding on far horizons, and the last over which was Elfland. And from house to house he gathered a little band of men, it was Alveric's dream to find the frontier further north, to travel on over the fields we know, always searching new horizons, till he came to some place from which Elfland had not ebbed. To this he determined to dedicate his days. When Lyrazel was with him amongst the fields we know, his thoughts had ever been to make her more earthly. But now that she was gone, the thoughts of his own mind were becoming daily more elvish, and folk began to look sideways at his fantastic mien. Dreaming always of Elfland and of elvish things, he gathered horses and provender, and made for his little band so huge a store of provisions, that those who saw it wondered. Many men he asked to be of that curious band, and few would go with him to haunt horizons, when they heard whither he went. And the first that he found to be of that band was a lad that was crossed in love, and then a young shepherd, well used to lonely spaces, then one that had heard a curious song that someone sang one evening. It had set his thoughts roving away to impossible lands, and so he was well content to follow his fancies. One huge full moon one summer had shone all a warm night long on a lad as he lay in the hay, and after that he had guessed or seen things that he said the moon showed him. Whatever they were, none else saw any such things in Earl. He also joined Alveric's band as soon as he asked him. It was many days before Alveric found these four, and more he could not find, but a lad that was quite witless, and he took him to tend the horses, for he understood horses well, and they understood him, though no human man or woman could make him out at all, except his mother, who wept when Alveric had his promise to go, for she said that he was the prop and support of her age, and knee, what storms would come, and when the swallows would fly and what colours the flowers would come up from seeds she sowed in her garden, and where the spiders would build their webs, and the ancient fables of flies. She wept, and said there would be more things lost by his going than ever folk guessed in Earl. But Alveric took him away. Many go thus. And one morning, six horses heaped, and hung with provisions all round their saddles, waited at Alveric's gateway, T, with the five men that were to roam with him as far as the world's edge. He had taken long counsel with Zerundarel, but she said that no magic of hers had power to charm Elfland, or to cross the dread will of its king. He therefore commended Orion to her care, knowing well that though hers was but simple or earthly magic, 
yet no magic likely to cross the fields we know, nor curse nor rune directed against his boy, would be able to thwart her spell, and for himself he trusted to the fortune that waits at the end of long weary journeys. To Orion he spoke long, not knowing how long that journey might be, before he again found Elfland, nor how easily he might return across the frontier of twilight. He asked the boy what he desired of life. To be a hunter, said he. What will you hunt while I am over the hills? said his father. Stags like Oth, said Orion. Alveric commended that sport, for he himself loved it. And some day I will go a long way over the hills and hunt stranger things, said the boy. What kind of things? asked Alveric. But the boy did not know. His father suggested different kinds of beasts. No, stranger than them, said Orion. Stranger even than bears. But what will they be? asked his father. Magic things, said the boy. But the horses moved restlessly down below in the cold, so that there was no time for more idle talks, and Alveric said farewell to the witch and his son, and strode away thinking little of the future, for all was too vague for thought. Alveric mounted his horse over the heaps of provisions, and all the band of six men rode away. The villagers stood in the street to see them go. All knew their curious quest, and when all had saluted Alveric, and all had called their farewells to the last of the riders, a hum of talk arose. And in the talk was contempt of Alveric's quest, and pity and ridicule, and sometimes affection spoke and sometimes scorn. Yet in the hearts of all there was envy, for their reason mocked the lonely roving of that outlandish adventure, but their hearts would have gone. And away rode Alveric out of the village of Earl, with his company of adventurers behind him. A moonstruck man, a madman, a lovesick lad, a shepherd boy, and a poet. And Alveric made Vand, the young shepherd, the master of his encampment, for he deemed him to be the sanest amongst his following. But there were disputes at once as they rode, before they came to make any encampment. And Alveric, hearing or feeling the discontent of his men, learned that on such a quest as his, it was not the sanest but the maddest that should be given authority. So he named Niv, the wheatless lad, the master of his encampment, and Niv served him well till a day that was far thence, and the moonstruck man stood by Niv, and all were content to do the bidding of Niv, and all honoured Alveric's quest. And many men, in numerous lands, do saner things with less harmony. They came to the uplands, and rode over the fields, and rode till they came to the furthest hedges of men, and to the houses that they have built at the verge, beyond which even their thoughts refuse to fare. Through this line of houses at the edge of those fields, four or five in every mile, Alveric went with his queer company. The leather worker's hut was far to the south. Now he turned northward to ride past the backs of the houses, over fields through which once the barrier of twilight had run, till he should find some place where Elfland might seem not to have ebbed so far. He explained this to his men and the leading spirits, Niv and Zend, who was moonstruck, applauded at once. And Thiel, the young dreamer of songs, said the scheme was a wise one too. And Vand was carried away by the keen zeal of these three, and it was all one to Rannoch the lover. And they had not gone far along the backs of the houses when the red sun touched the horizon, and they hastened to make an encampment by what remained of the light of that short winter's day. And Niv said they would build a palace like those of kings, and the idea fired Zend to work like three men, and Thiel helped eagerly, and they set up stakes and stretched blankets upon them, and made a wall of brushwood, for they were but just outside the hedgerows, and Vand helped too with rough hurdles, and Rannoch toiled on warily. And when all was finished, Niv said that it was a palace, and Alveric went in and rested, while they lit a fire outside. And Vand cooked a meal for them all, which he did every day for himself upon lonely downs, and none could have cared for the horses better than Niv. And as the gloaming faded away, the cold of winter grew, and by the time that the first star shone, there seemed nothing in all the night but bitter cold. Yet Alveric's men lay down by their fire in their leathers and furs and slept, all but Rannoch the lover. To Alveric, lying on furs in his shelter, watching red embers glowing beyond dark shapes of his men, the quest promised well. He would go far north, watching every horizon for any sign of Elfland. He would go by the border of the fields we know, and always be near provisions, 
and if he got no glimpse of the pale blue mountains, he would go on till he found some field from which Elfland had not ebbed, and so come round behind them. And Niv and Zend and Thyl had all sworn to him that evening that before many days were gone, they would surely all find Elfland. Upon this thought he slept, 